Again, welcome to Mosaic Church. Um, we're happy to have everyone here this morning, um, and happy Mother's Day to everybody, especially to the mothers out there. Um, uh, my name is David Nesbitt. I'm a pastoral intern at Mosaic, and um, I've been here for three and a half years now, since the summer of 2013. Um, going on four years this summer, and I love this church. Um, so I'm really excited to be preaching from God's Word to you this morning um, and get the chance to uh, study His Word with you. So first things first, it is Mother's Day, um, and I do want to recognize all the mothers and um, celebrate you this morning, especially my mom who's sitting here. Um, she would not want to be called out, um, but I'm too proud of her not to say something about her. Um, mom, I said thank you for showing me what sacrificial looks like since the day I was born. I know I've been a handful, um, so I'm sure it took a lot of sacrificial love. Um, if anyone wants to argue that their mom is better, um, we can take this outside later and settle this in a duel or something. But even if I lose, my mom's still better. So, Brandon, you want to take me up on that? Okay. To all the moms that are here, um, as a single man in his 20s, I want you to know that every year that passes, I really grow in admiration and awe for what you do. Um, I think that the sacrificial and selfless love that you show is amazing. Um, and watching the moms in our church selflessly parent their kids um, is amazing, and it's a blessing. Whether your kids are tiny or fully grown, I think you should each be recognized from the stage this morning. You deserve that. Um, and I think that moms are probably the closest thing we have to real-life superheroes. Uh, I think that with my own mom. The things that you do um, defy uh, reality sometimes, I think, and are amazing to see. Um, if you long to be a mother... Um, but you're not a mother yourself with earthly kids. Um, the Apostle Paul calls Timothy his true child in the faith in 1 Timothy. So likewise, I want to thank you for your beautiful mothering of the spiritual children that God's given you and put in your life. Thank you to all mothers for your constant sacrificing and loving and dying to yourself and showing us a picture of what God's love and care for us looks like. So happy Mother's Day to all of you. Before we continue, let me pray for God's blessing in this sermon, um, just for him to speak through me this morning. Let's pray. God, I thank you for this chance to come together with your church. Um, thank you for Mosaic Church that you've established this church as a group, a body of believers that uh, worships you um, and wants to um, learn to know you more, to pursue you together. I pray that you'd speak through me this morning, um, that anything I say would be guided by the Spirit. Um, if there's anything that I um, plan to say that's not um, from you, God, I pray that it would pass through the ears of uh, anyone here that they would not remember. And the things that stick that we remember would be the things that, um, God, you want us to hear this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. So at Mosaic right now, we're in a series called Family, God's Framework for the Church in the Home. And what we've been seeing in this series is that God designed the home to be a training ground for life in his kingdom, life in the family of God. So in the first week, Shannon set the scene more generally for what God's created in the family and how those relationships prepare us for life in the family of God. So that was more general in the first week. In the second week, we got more specific and talked about what it looks like to be a son or a daughter in an earthly family, as well as how that mirrors what it means to be a child of God and his son and daughter. And then last week, we discussed how we should parent both to our earthly children as well as to the spiritual children that we have when we disciple people toward Christ. And this morning, I'm going to be teaching about how we should relate to each other as brothers and sisters. Now, my original plan was to title this The Holy Kiss, and we were going to talk a lot about simple, radical obedience to the command to greet each other with a holy kiss. Um, and I thought I could maybe sneak that in while Shannon was gone this week, but um, yeah, I uh, thought about it a little bit more, and I didn't want to steal the thunder from the moms today. I thought that could get a little crazy, so um, I'll save that one for later. So instead, uh, I want to talk about how we love one another. How we relate to each other as brothers and sisters in Christ and as peers is really important because it's our most common relationship in the church and in life in general. We have some authorities over us in life. We have a father and a mother, or several, or we have spiritual fathers and mothers, but everyone in our lives around us who has faith in Christ is a brother and sister with us. So this important relationship, it's valuable for us to know how to do this well because it's all around us. It's everyone that we deal with. In the same way that home is a training ground also for life in God's kingdom, your relationship with your earthly siblings and your earthly family is also really important because it's training ground for how you'll treat people the rest of your life, treat your peers. As a child, your relationship with your siblings 
or your friends, if you're an only child, is your chance to learn and grow and become more like Jesus in how you treat people. That's going to carry on for the rest of your life, and it's where you start setting those habits. And if you're a parent, your child's relationship with each other, with their siblings, with their close friends, is your opportunity to train them in how they're going to relate to their peers and especially to their brothers and sisters in Christ in the church for the rest of their lives. So these relationships are so important. What I want us to start with this morning is seeing that because of the way that Christ loved us, we must love our brothers and sisters. And as we follow him, we will love our brothers and sisters. And we're then, we're then going to talk about two ways that this works out in our lives. So first, why should Christ's love for us affect our relationship with other people? Like, okay, I get that Jesus loved me, and that's an amazing and undeserved gift. But why does that need to change how I treat Billy from my church or my brother Johnny? Um, why does it need, why do those necessarily have to impact each other? And to put it simply, it goes like this. We love because Jesus first loved us, as we hear in 1 John 4, 19. Because Jesus loves us and gave his life so that we could have life, the only proper response is to follow his example and love other people. Now, what do we mean when we say that he gave his life, that Jesus gave his life so that we could have life? What I'm referring to there is the gospel. That's the gospel that we talk about um, on a daily basis a weekly basis here at Mosaic, and this is the gospel. It's that God created man to worship and enjoy him forever. But we rebelled against God, our creator, and we sinned against him by doing what is evil. And all of us have sinned. Everybody in this room has sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, fallen short of his perfection. And God is perfect and just. He's a good judge, and he doesn't tolerate any evil. So we all deserve to be punished for our sin and a rebellion against him. And our punishment should be great because our sin was great against a perfect and holy God. And holy means set apart from sin. So because of this, the Bible tells us that we were all dead in our sins. We were destined for eternal death and for punishment. But that's not the end of the story. God is not only just, he's also merciful and he's loving and he's gracious. But if he just passed over our sin without punishing it or doing anything about our sin, he wouldn't be good. Think about a judge who did that, kind of swept things under the rug um, and let them go and let people go despite maybe them having really serious crimes. If God did that, he would be an unjust God, which is horrible to imagine. Think about living in a world that was ruled by a God who was unjust. So because God loved us, He sent his son Jesus to take the punishment that we should deserve so that we could be saved through faith in Jesus. So Jesus came and died on the cross for our sins so that God could be just by punishing our sin, but he could also forgive us and save us from our punishment. This is the amazing news of the gospel. Jesus said in John 15, greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. And Jesus did this. He committed the greatest act of love for us. And he said that he did it for the joy that was set before him, both the joy of living with us eternally in heaven, as well as pleasing his Father. So now, if we believe in Jesus and trust in his sacrifice on the cross for our salvation, we will be saved. We're given the righteousness of Christ, and we're made co heirs with him of everything, of the universe, which means he's our brother. And scripture actually describes him as our brother various times. We'll live forever forever with him in heaven and we'll worship him for his grace and greatness. That's the gospel. So the gospel is what drives everything we do in relating with our brothers and sisters. What should our response be to this amazing truth, this amazing gospel? Paul says it this way in 2 Corinthians 5, 14 and 15. He says, For the love of Christ controls us because we've concluded this, that one died for all and therefore all have died. And he died for all that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. So we now live for Christ, since that's the only thing we can do in response to the free, unimaginable gift that he gave us of salvation and the grace that he showed us. And if we're following Jesus as disciples of him, this will lead us to love others like he does. So in response to his love, we should love each other as brothers and sisters. And this can be a hard thing and something that we have to fight to do, both in our earthly families and with our spiritual family members. It's not always going to be natural. And 
it wouldn't, I don't think, be emphasized as much in Scripture if it was something that was easy and we didn't need to be reminded. But we're told many, many times to love one another. And God does command us what we ought to feel. So we might not feel capable of loving a particular brother or sister, um, but we are commanded to do so. So we need to seek to ask God in prayer that he gives us that love and seek to love them with our actions and pray that God will make our hearts follow that. So how should we love our brothers and sisters? Now that we see the connection between Christ's love for us and how that's a model for us of how we should love our brothers and sisters, how do we do that? I'm going to talk about two main ways um, that we do this. There are much more than this, so I'm only talking about two. that are kind of two sides of the same coin, so I think they go together well. And the first one I'll talk about is how we love our brothers and sisters by encouraging them. So in our earthly families, we have a tremendous opportunity to encourage our siblings. Think about this maybe in your own experience, you may see this. I remember when I was a kid, my first number in baseball was 14. And the reason was because they asked me, and my brother Daniel, my older brother, his number was seven, and I wanted that number, but it was already his, so I did two times his number. And in, when I started playing in band, I played trumpet, which is the instrument that he played. I really followed in his footsteps in a lot of ways um, with sports, with music, things that were really important to me growing up. And I think in many ways, we see siblings following each other's footsteps in a lot of ways. And I think because of this, the compliments or encouragement that we get from them can mean a lot to us. God gives us brothers and sisters in our earthly families. Also, I think as a team of cheerleaders, or as a cheerleader, or your friends are cheerleaders if you're an only child, we're kind of born into, as children, this built-in group of friends who by default have a vested interest in our lives, and they have a shared identity. My family has a group chat that we use, and when someone posts something, um, that's maybe encouraging, something exciting that happened to them, or something that's difficult that's going on in their life, brothers and sisters respond with encouragement or with celebration, depending on what it is. And I think families can have this really fierce and loyal love between brothers and sisters because of the bond that their shared identity brings, and it's a beautiful thing to see when that happens. It doesn't always work out like this. Family relationships are hard, and I think some of you are probably hearing this and thinking that encouraging is probably the last word that I would use to describe my relationship with my sibling. But if there is, a, if there is godly love in the family, the relationship between brothers and sisters in the home can be a beautiful and encouraging thing. In the church as well, we have brothers and sisters in Christ. And with them, we also have a shared identity that we're children of God. Encouraging these brothers and sisters is one of the most important ways that we love each other. And why do we need to encourage? Why is it important that we encourage each other? We do this encouragement with our brothers and sisters in the church because we're in a battle. But Paul tells us in Ephesians that our, as believers, we're not in a battle with the people around us, but rather we're in, we're in a battle with spiritual forces of evil that are at work in our world. So whether you feel like this is true or not, whether you relate to that and see that on a daily basis, that is the truth. Um, whether I see that or not, it's the truth in my life and in yours. So if you look around your church and around your missional community, these brothers and sisters God has placed there to help you in this battle, to be your fellow soldiers, and we need each other to make it through the war. We're united by this common battle, in fact. So if that's the situation, what does it look like to do this encouraging then? If we're in a battle, a spiritual battle with one another, how should I be encouraging my brothers and sisters at my missional community um, or in church um, when I'm eating a donut with them in the atrium before, before the service? Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews, tells us a little bit more about what this battle is like and also gives us some instruction for how we're supposed to handle it. Hebrews 3, 12 through 14 says this, Take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart, leading you to fall away from the living God. But exhort one another every day, as long as it is called today, that none of you may be deceived by hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. But exhort one another every day, it says, as long as it is called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Satan's goal is to kill our faith in God and in his promises. Think back with me to the original sin, the story in Genesis of Adam and Eve in the garden when they sinned and humanity fell. When Satan tempted Eve to eat that fruit that God told her she would die if she would eat, God had clearly told her that, but Satan was doing this very thing with her. He was tempting her to not believe God. He tempted her to believe that what God said was not true, and he said, 
You actually won't die if you eat this, and in fact, you'll become like God. And Eve was hardened through the deceitfulness of that sin that he was tempting her with, and she didn't believe God's word to her. And similarly, Satan is constantly lying and attacking each one of us to kill our faith in what God says, to get us to stop believing what he says. He wants us to be deceived by sin. He wants us to be hardened against God as we decide that sin looks good and life-giving and better than God, and we reject the true life that we can experience in God. So what do we do about this? How can we fight this, particularly for our brothers and sisters in the church, if we're in this battle? We encourage and we exhort them. Now, what does exhort mean? I love this word. Um, and we heard it a moment ago in that, in that verse in Hebrews three thirteen. Exhorting means to strongly encourage or urge someone to do something. And here's how I think about this idea of exhorting or encouraging. Okay? I need you to use your imaginations with me. You guys ready? So imagine that I'm running a marathon. And this is a stretch because I've only run like four miles at a time before. But again, use that imagination. And I'm at mile 25, but I'm fading quickly. I've listened to the best songs on my Pump Up running playlist, and the only thing left is that all-star song by Smash Mouth. It's like, somebody once told me, and I don't even know how it got on there, but it did, and now it's repeating, and my fingers are shaking too much to change the song because I have low blood sugar. So I'm in a bad spot, right? I'm, I'm just keeping the pace and staying steady, but I'm questioning whether I can make it, and my will to keep running is dwindling. My steps have slowed down to just plodding, and maybe I'm not going to make it. And I've trained for months to do this, but I don't know if I have it in me to finish. I'm so close to the end, but one more mile is a heck of a long way when you've already done 25 miles. But suddenly, another runner comes into view. And who could it be? It's my handsome friend, Chris Din. And Chris actually runs marathons, so he's looking good. He's running strong, and he's running well. And he slows down next to me, and he runs next to me. And Chris starts talking to me as I'm plodding along. He says, you're so close, just keep going. You can do it. Tells me, remember, just like you trained, keep running. Think about the finish line and think about how great it will be when we finish. So what happens? My pace starts to pick up. I feel a little surge of energy and I stop thinking about my legs and my lungs and the pain and I start thinking about reaching the finish line. So I'm thinking about running across it with Chris and the feeling of joy and accomplishment when I finish. And Chris and I run next to each other. We feed off of each other's strength and motivation to keep running. And this is exactly what I mean and want us to think about when I use the word exhort. In a spiritual sense, I mean coming alongside someone in love and encouraging and pleading with them to have faith in God and to keep their eyes on Christ and to keep running their race, keep running after him. I mean running alongside them to encourage and strengthen them. So when Satan tempts our brothers and sisters to believe that sin is better than what God has promised us, or that what God says isn't true, we exhort them to put their hope in God and trust him. We run alongside them to encourage and to strengthen them. Now, when I'm talking about encouraging one another, I don't mean that we should do this in like a shallow way where we throw platitudes out there and feel like that fulfills what God calls us to. Um, there's a lot of shallow Christianity that's thrown around. Um, and I think trust God and Jesus loves you are important and foundational truths. But they can tend to lose their meaning if people who don't know us well or don't know our situations well and don't take the time to know us well throw them out there as easy answers to real suffering in our lives or hard things and painful things or struggles in our faith. So I think in order to be able to exhort and encourage in a meaningful way, we have to get to know each other well. We have to know about each other's lives, which means we have to enter into the broken and painful and sinful parts of each other's lives. And to know each other in this way means we have to spend time together. Paul said in that verse, Hebrews 3.13, that we have to exhort each other daily. And how can we do that if we only see our brothers and sisters in Christ on a Sunday? While we were talking about this topic of brother and sister relationships in the church um, a couple weeks ago, um, a couple of the guys I was talking with mentioned that some of their deepest relationships have been in the church, much deeper, in fact, than some of the relationships outside of the church, even if they spent more time with those people. And why is that? 
I think it's because being in a gospel community where we acknowledge that we're broken and sinful people who need God's help, that brings about deep conversations. When people are vulnerable and share their deep questions and insecurities and pains and fears, others have the opportunity to come alongside them in a way that builds deep, intimate relationships and builds trust. But being part of a church community, it won't guarantee that you have these kinds of deep relationships. And some of you know that from experience. If you don't have these kinds of deep relationships, I would encourage you to seek those out. Do you have people in your life who you can go to when you're struggling spiritually and when your faith is faltering? People that can bolster your faith and help you keep running your race. Like I was talking about the image of Christ. You have people that run alongside you in your faith. I have a couple friends who do this for me, and I think that we should seek to have people in our lives that we do this with and that do this for us. That's what relationships in the church are for. And if you don't have this and you're not sure who could be this for you, I have a couple encouragements for you. One, I would say pray for this and ask God for the blessing of relationships that you can, where you can bolster and strengthen them in their faith and where they do the same for you. And secondly, I would say seek to be this for other people first. Let's not be consumeristic and expect people just to fulfill our needs that you should be doing this for me and if I'm not getting this in the church, something's wrong with the church. We also need to take a look at ourselves and see that something may be wrong with the way that we relate to people. Are we laying down our lives to love other people? So what would this look like to be this for other people, to be that kind of a friend who can bolster and strengthen and encourage in faith? I think there's a few simple things we can do, like ask people questions about their life. Learn about their lives. Encourage them in the things that you learn about. And love them just to love them and not to get something out of it for yourself. If you do have close friends in the church, but when I describe that kind of a relationship, it's nothing like that. You know, it's, it's on the surface. It's shallow. You don't talk about your faith. Um, there are brother or sister in Christ, but you just don't talk about God. I would encourage you to change that. In the end, if we're not pointing each other to God and there's relationships and encouraging each other in the faith, then what are we doing? Do we understand the battle that we're in if that's not the, the case in our relationships, if we're not doing that? I think there's probably a misunderstanding. This is why God's given us our church families to help us pursue him. And that's the purpose of this community, to glorify him through helping each other do that. Being part of a missional community at Mosaic, I think is a great way to pursue those kinds of deep relationships. Being in a smaller group, a community group of some sort. And it takes work. So invest yourself and ask God to bless your efforts. But as we get to know each other deeply in the church, we're also going to see sin in each other's lives. This is going to happen, and we're going to sin against each other. Everyone in this room, if you spend at all any kind of time in the church, you're going to be sinned against multiple times, many times, and you're going to sin against other people. That's just the reality of our lives and the sinful flesh that we still carry while we're in this world. God tells us in Scripture that part of loving our brothers and sisters, just like encouraging them, that part of it is also confronting them about sin. God calls this correcting or rebuking or approving them in Scripture. And all these have this idea of addressing someone else's sin or incorrect belief for their good so that they could benefit from us doing it. These all kind of have the idea of confronting in them. So confrontation is hard and it's painful for both sides, both confronting someone about something, no matter whether it's about sin or anything else in life, um, and it's hard to receive it. It's not a popular thing. I don't like confrontation myself. I like to be able to be happy and to like me. Um, and I think probably most people in this room feel that way in a certain, to a certain extent. Um, is there anybody who actually likes confrontation out there? Just, just kidding. Don't actually raise your hand for that. But um, think about it. But uh, we see in God's word that this is really an important way that we should love each other. That we should love by encouraging each other, and we also love by confronting each other lovingly about the sin we see in each other's lives. And in some ways, these are two sides of the same coin, like I mentioned. These go together. We can't settle for one without the other. We need both. Think about it this way. With siblings in the home, if we were only to encourage each other all the time and never to warn or disagree with them, that wouldn't actually be loving or healthy. I know that I was an idiot at a lot of points growing up, and my siblings could attest to that, and my parents too, although they maybe be a little bit more gentle about it, but um, it was necessary for my siblings to point out to me that I was in the wrong sometimes, or maybe most of the time, um, and that to help me to see where I was wrong in my life. And maybe you weren't an idiot when you were a kid. 
and I hope not for your sake and for your sibling's sake, but I think you can probably relate in a certain sense and that you understand what I'm talking about. That's a way that we loved each other. So we need to bring up sin to one another in love. There's definitely a way to do that that's not loving in the way that we probably experience with our siblings that's not loving, but there's also a way to confront about sin that is loving and for that other person's good. So I'm not going to be able to cover everything about rebuking, correcting others this morning because there's a ton that can be said about this topic, but I will cover a couple big ideas to help us think about this well and do it in a way that is pleasing to God. And I'll spend more time on this probably than encouraging simply because it's very complex and it's a sensitive topic. Um, it's one very, we can very easily get wrong, but it's also very important that we know how to do it well. But it's not more important than encouraging. I just want to remind you of that too, that it's not that I'm spending more time in it because it's, it's more necessary. We always, we always need to be encouraging. Thankfully, we don't always have to rebuke. Um, it's not something we have to do every single day, every hour, every minute. So let's jump into this. As we prepare though to jump in, on what it means to confront people about their sin, let's consider something that Jesus taught us about this. In the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 7, Jesus says, and a lot of us are familiar with this phrase, um, that, and I'll paraphrase this, Jesus said to the crowds of people, why do you try to take the speck out of your brother's eye when there's a log in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the log out of your own eye, and then you'll see clearly to take the speck out of your eye. Out of your brother's eye, I'm sorry. So first take the log out of your own eye and you'll see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. So Jesus is teaching here that we're supposed to take a look at our own lives first and deal with our own sin before dealing with our brother or sister's sin. And first that involves recognizing that we have sin too. So if you don't recognize it from the beginning, a first step in confronting other people about sin well and loving them is understanding our own sinful nature and the sin that we live in as well. And to understand that we are absolutely no better off than them. In fact, there's a good chance, probably 50-50, that we're worse than them. Um, And we're actually less righteous than them in general. So we need to recognize the fact that we have sin as well. If we have a log sticking out of our own eye that we won't do something about, and we're trying to tell someone else that they have a speck in their eye that we're going to get out for them, that's hypocrisy and it's ridiculous. But Jesus does assume in saying this, though, that once we deal with our sin— We'll take the speck out of our brother's eye. We will take that step. So let's look at how we should do this. So first, why do we confront others about their sin? Why should we do this? Again, the overarching reason here is that we do it because we love them. Confronting others about sin should always, always be done in love, with love in mind. And we'll talk more about what that looks like in a minute. So one reason we confront about sin is that we do it to protect our brothers and sisters from dying. If we don't turn from our sins in our lives back to God, they will lead to pain and misery for ourselves and for other people. And if if we allow them to stay in our lives and to fester and grow, they can eventually lead to spiritual death. And we see this in James 5, 19 and 20. James writes, My brothers, if any among you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. Let me read that again. My brothers, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. So just like with our earthly siblings growing up, If we saw them doing something which might hurt them badly or kill them, we would warn them lovingly, hopefully, out of a desire for harm or evil not to come to them. If I'm playing in a busy street, it would be loving for my sister Stephanie to try to bring me back out of the street before I'm hit by a car. That's a loving thing to do. And the stakes are even higher in the Christian life, as high as those stakes are that I just described. The stakes are even higher as a believer um, in the Christian walk because this battle is real and we're talking about eternal life and death on the line. Have you ever known anyone who's walked away from faith in Christ? If you're a Christian long enough, you'll probably experience this, unfortunately. And we have no control over whether someone perseveres in their faith or not. That's not something we can control or something that others can control for us. But God has given us a role in helping each other recognize the deceitfulness of sin and staying steadfast in our pursuit of Christ. That is a role of ours. So we confront each other about sin to protect each other from death. 
Another reason that we do this and confront each other about sin is to help each other live lives that are glorifying to God. God is glorified when, while we're following Jesus, while we're a disciple of his and following him, we reflect back to others what God is like, what he loves, even imperfectly, even in our imperfect ways. Uh, We can reflect that back to others when we follow Christ. But even if our ultimate desire is to live a life that pleases and glorifies God, we all fail at this on a daily basis in many ways, each one of us. And we need help from our brothers and sisters to get back on track, to be reminded and warned about the deceitfulness of sin and how good and beautiful God and his ways and his grace are. A third reason we confront about sin is to help maintain unity and peace in the body of Christ. Whether the sin that we're thinking about is against us or someone else, bringing up sin gives that other person the opportunity to recognize sin they may not have realized was there or that maybe they were unwilling to deal with previously. It gives them the chance to confess this sin to God and to seek to make things right with any brothers or sisters that they've hurt or sinned against. And if we don't address sin like this that's affecting brothers and sisters in the church or in our earthly families, they can ultimately divide the family divide the church, and it can cause pain and broken relationships, things that aren't beautiful and are not fitting in the body of Christ. So now that we've looked at why we should confront about sin, when should we do this? How do we know when the right time is to do this? We can't confront every sin that we see, so we know that much. If we try to confront every sin that we witnessed, uh, we wouldn't have time for anything else, um, and it wouldn't be realistic or helpful. Um, we would just be beating people down all the time. And I've str- often struggled to know when is the right time to do this um, or what sin is right for me to bring up given my relationship with a person. I think I struggle with cowardice and fear in this area as well. Um, fear about how that person will react, fear of whether this will push them away from me, um, and fear about whether they're even going to understand what I'm trying to help them see. So in this process, that can be confusing for me and for you. We have to start with Scripture. That's what God has given us to know him and to know what he loves and what he calls us to. Ultimately, anytime we confront someone about sin, what we say to them needs to be backed up by Scripture. What we're trying to bring up to them needs to be backed up by Scripture. We're not called to confront people about things that are just our preferences, like, I don't like that you do this. Um, that could be a sin. It could be involved. It could be related to sin. But um, what we're called to is calling people up to the standard of God's truth and what He's told us and called us to. In Second Timothy three, Paul says that all Scripture is breathed out by God and is useful for teaching, reproof, correction, and training in righteousness. So God's word is where we learn for ourselves what He loves and what righteousness actually is that we're supposed to train each other in. What is this righteousness that we should train each other in? We go to God's word to find that. And ultimately, we we need wisdom from God to know when is the right time to confront and when it's better to wait or let someone else do it. So I encourage you to ask him for wisdom in this area. This is a challenging area. Um, Ask God to give you wisdom and guidance by the Spirit. But I want to give us some practicals to think about. Um, And these are not going to be comprehensive of everything I'm confronting, but a few things for us to think about and to mull over and even think about their own situations in our lives and how they might be similar or different than these and what God would call us to do. I want to give us some examples of when I think that we should prayerfully consider confronting someone about sin. And I'll give us three of them. First, when a person's repeatedly doing something, something that Scripture clearly defines as sin without seemingly want to repent. When a person is repeatedly doing something that Scripture clearly defines as sin without seemingly wanting to repent. Or maybe they're just unaware of the sin is even there. Like, it doesn't seem they even recognize that they're doing this sin, but you see it, and maybe others see it as well. And I should clarify that these also would be between brothers and sisters in the church. So if someone is in Christ, that's when a, re- a confrontation about sin or rebuke about sin makes sense. Outside of that context, it's a very different conversation. Um, so I just want to clarify that, that I'm talking about between brothers and sisters in Christ. A second example of a time, and I think we should prayerfully consider confronting, is when a person commits serious sin, perhaps even just one time without repentance. And I'm using the term serious sin to refer to things that God speaks out against more strongly or severely in Scripture. For example, if someone sins sexually with another person, or if they teach the others something about God that goes against Scripture, those might be times that even just one time is enough that we need to bring it up to them. 
The last one, I would say, is when a person has hurt someone else by their sin so that there's unresolved pain and conflict and they haven't sought to make things right. I think it's a time we should prayerfully consider bringing up that sin to them. I also want to give us a few times when I think it might be wise to consider not confronting them or at least not doing it right then. And the first thing I would say before I enter this is that there's never a good time for rebuke. If you've done this before and had to bring up someone's sin to them, there's never a time that it like feels totally right and you're like, this is perfect and it went, they were happy about it and um, that was just easy. So don't wait for the perfect opportunity for this um, because it won't come and we'll end up never being obedient to God's call to us. But a few times when I think it might be wise to consider not confronting or at least waiting would be one, when someone is aware of the sin already and they're trying to turn from it. Like a sibling who's always telling us what we're doing wrong and how that can be demoralizing for us, we also don't want to pe- beat down our brothers and sisters in Christ in the church and discourage them if they're carrying a heavy load of something that they're already aware of. It could be just, again, discouraging for them to hear it one more time if they're already dealing with it. Another situation where it might be wise to consider not confronting or at least waiting would be when they're dealing with other painful things in their life or they're already dealing with other sin in their life and it might demoralize them. When I say like demoralize, I don't just mean like they're going to feel bad about it. Because like I said, it's never a good time for rebuke. It's always a painful thing. And it should be a painful thing on both sides for you to deliver that as well as for them to hear it. That's normal. But I mean, we should choose our time well so we don't crush them if there's something that God's already doing in their life. A third time I think we should consider prayerfully consider um, waiting or not confronting would be when they've shown in the past that they don't accept confrontation about sin from you well. In this case, there might be another person who knows them better, who's better suited to have that conversation with them. And I think that's an important thing to consider. Are you the best person to have this conversation, um, to confront this person about this particular sin? Is there anyone more appropriate with a closer relationship Or maybe a man is the best person to have this conversation with a man and a woman with a woman, vice versa. And these questions that I'm presenting as kind of caveats are not, they're not about shirking responsibility of confrontation. But instead, everything needs to be done with this in view when we think about confrontation. Everything should be focused on what's the most loving and helpful way to bring this person's sin to their attention for their good and the glory of God. So the question we have to always think about at the center of confrontation and rebuking about sin is, what's the most loving and helpful way to bring up this person's sin to them? And if possible, if if you're considering doing this, confronting someone about sin, but you're not sure how to go about it, or if it's the right time, um, or what you're doing in general, um, I'd encourage you to get counsel from mature believers around you. You don't have to share specifics about the situation, who it is that you're talking about, um, but even generally give them a sense of what your questions are or what you're struggling about, like, I'm not sure, you know, what context or kind of, should I do it around other people or by myself or should I um, tell them ahead of time I want to do this? Ask mature believers around you um, and I think that they can give you wise advice um, in terms of what their experiences have been. I also heard a great Matt Chandler sermon on this topic last week about confrontation. We spent a whole sermon talking about this. So if you want to learn more about it, I'd be happy to share that with you as well. So now that we've looked at why we confront and when we do that, Lastly, how should we confront others about sin? And this is maybe most important, probably most important. One dad in the church that I talked to about this topic shared what it's like between his two children. He said the older one is always trying to teach and rebuke and correct the younger one and love them. And if it's done with gentleness and love, the younger one can receive it and learn. And you see the acceptance in their face as they take that correction, that teaching from their older sibling. But when the older one's attitude is kind of lording it over the younger one or bossing them around, the response is different. The face of the younger one turns the other way and there's anger and there's not a response. There's not a good response. So similarly, we should confront in love with a view of winning back our brother and sister. We should do this in what John Piper calls a bubble of grace, where you make sure that they know that you love them and you accept them, and you remind them of Christ's grace for them. You shouldn't do it in a way that's condemning to them or makes them feel like they're lower than you or that God views them differently because of the sin that you're telling them. So we should keep these in mind and, again, do it in this bubble of grace where we show them grace and bring it up lovingly. 
We should also bring up their sin with a view to how they can be blessed by it, how it can be for their good. I think in the end, um, we need to keep focus on how is this brother or sister going to be blessed? How could they be blessed or the body of Christ be blessed by me bringing this up? I think we should also be brokenhearted for having to wound our brothers and sisters um, with a rebuke or, incur- or a correction, but we should do it despite the pain because of our love for them. I think we should really strive for this, that when, if I'm confronting that I want to do it in a spirit where I'm brokenhearted for having to wound them, but I'm doing it because I want good for them. Proverbs 27 says this, Faithful are the wounds of a friend, and profuse are the kisses of an enemy. So there are wounds from a friend that are a faithful and good and helpful thing. And I think this doing, confronting about sin in a loving way fits into that category. So we should balance a rebuke with encouragement. Again, these are two sides of the same coin. Encourage them about what you see God doing in their life and the fruit that you see in them, and encourage them that they're loved and delighted in by God. We should also confront with gentleness. If we can't confront gently, then it's going to be a beating for other people. It's just going to be brutal. Paul says that without love, we're nothing and we're a resounding gong. In Galatians 6.1, he also tells us that if someone's caught in sin, we who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. So this gentleness is core. If you can't confront with gentleness, you're not confronting the way that God has called you to. We need to stay faithful to the truth and not sacrifice truth, but to do it with gentleness, not bashing people over the head with truth. We speak the truth in love as we call others up to maturity. And we graciously and lovingly remind them of what God has called us to and bring their attention to what we believe, where we believe they're in sin. So we might feel like I could never rebuke. Um, You might be thinking that or confront people because I know how much sin that I have, which is true. We have tons of sin. But this is actually unloving. It's not a loving thing to say that I'm not going to do this because I have sin as well, and so I just couldn't do that. Because we're never going to be without sin, but Christ calls us to confront each other about sin and to call each other to repentance. We're not calling people up to a standard that we've achieved. I'm not calling people up to the standard of David, and you're not calling them up to your standard of the righteousness that you've achieved. But we're telling them, and we're not telling them, you know, you need to get where I am. But instead, we're calling them up to God's standard that he's called us to. And that should be a humbling thing. That should help us be humble as we confront and rebuke because we recognize that we also fall so short of God's standard. And this rebuke could just as well be coming to us. Lastly, and I'm not going to spend uh, much time on this at all, but I also wanted to leave us with some thoughts about how do we respond to someone else if they confront us about sin? And again, this could be a whole sermon on its own, um, and it's something I think we should each think about. But simply, I want to leave us with two things to think about. First, let's remember that rebuke and confrontation about sin is a way to love each other. So when you receive that from other people, seek to see it that way and receive it that way as if they're loving you. And secondly, we shouldn't be surprised if there is sin in our lives that people are seeing. That's going to happen. It should happen for all of us. So if someone's bringing sin up to us, our first response should probably not be, doubt and skepticism that they are seeing this accurately, but it should probably be, they're probably right. Like, before I even hear it, I should say, if someone wants to confront me about sin, I should probably say, yeah, there's probably definitely some truth in what they're saying. We have sin in our lives, and we shouldn't be surprised when other people bring it to us. And in fact, if no one ever rebukes us for our sin, there's probably something wrong with that. Either we're not able to receive it from people, um, or our community is not being obedient to God and their call to call us up to righteousness. So when we do receive that rebuke, let's take what we can from it humbly. Let's accept it and accept it as love. So Jesus laid down his life for us, and he showed us what it means to be a true brother. He's our example that we set our eyes on and that we seek to model our lives after and follow him to walk in the same ways he walked. We need to be true brothers and sisters to each other in the way that Christ loved us and laid down his life for us. What does it look like to love like Jesus did? Laying down our lives for each other. Dying to ourselves. And two important ways that we live that out is by encouraging and exhorting each other and by confronting each other and bringing up our sin to each other. As we close, I want us to go back to Hebrews 3, 12-14. 
as it really sums this up well. It says, take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God. But exhort one another every day, as long as it is called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we have come to share in Christ, if indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end. So let's seek to know each other deeply and to share our struggles and pains and fears with each other so that we can encourage our brothers and sisters and they can encourage us. So we can encourage each other to keep believing in God and in his promises and not to lose hope. Let's run alongside one another and encourage each other to keep going. We have come to share in Christ if indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end. And let's lovingly and prayerfully bring up sin to one another so that none of us may be hardened by deceitfulness of sin. Please pray with me. God, I thank you for your word um, that give us instruction of um, how to love each other, um, how to follow you, how to please you, God. Um, I pray that um, as we think about encouraging each other and confronting each other, you'd give us wisdom. Um, help us to see... Um, where we need to do this in our lives, God, and give us wisdom to know how to go about it. Uh, I pray that you would guide us, Father, and you'd give us deep and fierce love for our brothers and sisters and our families on earth as well as our spiritual families, our brothers and sisters in Christ. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.